We have a couple of guests joining us in the studio during the uh, course of this half hour of the program, and we're talking about cancer, but we're not talking specific cancers or causes of cancers today. We're talking about impact, and, and often sort of sharing in the last half hour when I, I mentioned our guests coming along, uh, those of us who've actually had someone in the family who've, uh, who've suffered from cancer, uh, we know the impact it not only has on, on, on those people, but as well as the family members. And uh, we've got, of course, Jeremy Daly joining us this morning from Trip Family Medicine right here in Twin Falls. First of all, welcome back. Thanks, Bill. Good to be here. And you brought along a friend today as well. I did. I brought Val Silly with me. He's a, he's a licensed counselor, and uh, we're going to work together and give some ideas on what you can do as a family member. Val, right off the top, we should point out that that's the key. Don't go see an unlicensed counselor. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's I, usually I, called the bartender, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's social workers out there do a great job. Uh, counselors, therapists, however, just, yeah, make sure you, you are talking to somebody who knows what they're doing. Well, I mentioned my own personal experience in all of this. My brother passed away. It'll be six years this summer after his second round of cancer. My sister had to deal with most of that being that he lived local at the time or had returned home and uh, tremendous stress on her. And within a couple of years, uh, my niece came down with cancer, survived, uh, but they're still dealing with a fallout from this four years later. And some days when I'm on the telephone with her, all of these years later, you can still tell that there's a, a bit of a bit of a drain there. And I guess these are issues that, that we have to consider when anything like this comes up in any, especially end of life or threat to life issue. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely um, a lot of issues that go along with the end of life, um, especially, you know, right after diagnosis, it's a big shock for a lot of people, especially if it's something that wasn't anticipated. And most of the time it's not, you know, we, we all assume that we're healthy and we all want to be healthy. So when we're told that we're not, when we're given a diagnosis like cancer, then really what happens is we think I'm going to die. This is a death sentence. And that's, that's what family hears too. They say, well, how long do they have to live? You know, that's, that's almost always the first question that comes out of patients and their family's mouths is, well, how long am I going to be living for? What's my, what's my prognosis? And, uh, you know, it's, unfortunately it's not as easy as, well, it's going to be six months or a year, you know, definitely there's some cancers that are more aggressive and, and scary and they can have, you know, worse prognosis initially. But, you know, the, the thing that we want to talk about really is, well, what do you do as a family member to, to give support to, to these family members who have been diagnosed with cancer? How do you be there for them and respect their decisions to go through certain treatments or sometimes to not go through treatments? And, you know, how do you help them to make it through the end of the life? And obviously, you know, it, it's... Uh... It's the challenge emotionally. There's a financial challenge. Uh, in fact, there's, there's probably multiple different things we're looking at. Uh, you, you just want to save someone from some sort of a nervous breakdown, as we used to call it, right? An emotional mm -hmm. collapse. That's what you're looking at. Yeah. You, you know, with significant news like this, mostly it's fear and grief. And, and you know, person may not be passing away anytime soon, but there's still a big loss of role, loss of what ifs. Uh, and that fear, that catastrophe thinking can really be mitigated if you've got somebody to talk to, educate yourself, find out different options. And there's really a lot of coping skills that you can learn to help you manage all that stress, all that anxiety, all that fear. Sometimes, too, in these families, if you've had people who've been at loggerheads with each other, and all of a sudden perhaps a family member hasn't been very communicative with somebody else in the family and this comes along, You've got to break that barrier down, too, because there's a lot of guilt associated with that. Absolutely. You know, we all have our certain levels of communication we have now, and then you bring a diagnosis of cancer on. Your communication really has to up its game in order to, to process that as a family member and everybody feels supported. Everybody wonders, you know, what do I say? What, how do I, what do I do? What's the right thing to say? And there's really not a right thing to say. Really, it's just be there, listen, be present. Uh, but at the same time, be honest. You know, if you're holding back, you're not, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. 
they feel that, you know, the, the patient feels that, the family members feel that, communication breaks down and, and really sets a lot of people up for additional frustration, additional stress. I think about that because uh, it's been 35 or 36 years, an aunt passed away after cancer and uh, at the, uh, the funeral home during the viewing, uh, somebody came through and of course she'd lost a considerable amount of weight in those last months. And so the woman's comments to the family were along the lines of, well, she always did want to lose weight. Uh, so sometimes people try to come up with something and it just doesn't work. It's it's like a bad joke at the really, the, the, the timing of it is terrible. We've got to take a short break. Uh, and, but people are going to get a lot of that, I'm sure. And maybe we can address some of that too, because how do you, how do you deal with it when somebody says something that they may think is right, but it's uh, it's it's terribly insensitive? We've got more coming up in just a moment. Uh, Jeremy Daly joining us from Trip Valley Medicine and Val Seeley. A licensed counselor. We're talking about how you deal with uh, with a situation with a family member, especially a loved one, comes down with cancer. It's 20 minutes now from nine o'clock. Call it 36. Bill Colley with you as well this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX. A couple of guests joining us in studio this morning on Better Health with Trip Family Medicine. You're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX as well as online NewsRadio1310.com, which means, of course, you can listen to us anywhere all over the world. Uh, Val Seeley is uh, joining the uh, medical professionals here as a special guest this morning. Val is a licensed counselor, and we're talking about how you deal with folks in the family and how yourself you would be dealing with it if someone comes down with a, uh, a diagnosis of cancer, especially if it looks to be a terminal illness. Jeremy Daly, of course, physician assistant, uh, joins us, uh, I think, in the rotation about once a month now, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as the office gets bigger, uh, you know, your appearances get fewer. I think you've got to get that put into your next contract. That's right. <laughs> Jeremy was sharing with us off air uh, that there are a lot of choices a patient has to make. And then Val brought up something interesting, too. Sometimes the family member says, well, wait a minute. I, 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 they almost try to trump the patient's decisions. And so you've got a lot of tug of war going on here. Yeah, definitely. You know, And we, we talked a lot about the, um, the principle of autonomy, which is one of the, the key principles of medical ethics. And Basically, what it is is, you know, we, as medical professionals, we provide information, we provide education as best as we can to the patient. Sometimes that means getting them to the right specialist, um, getting them the right study to be done so that we can see where things are at as far as staging cancer and knowing what type of cancer it is so that we know what's what's the prognosis for the patient. And you know, the, the dilemma that we were talking about is sometimes patients, they have no interest in pursuing any further workup as far as, well, what exactly is this? What kind of diagnosis is this? And what kind of life expectancy do I have? Sometimes they, they just, they don't want to do it. And, you know, brings up a, a dilemma that, that we were talking about as far as, well, what do you do as a family member? And, you know, it, it is a tough decision, but as a medical professional, one of the one of the things that we, like I said, we really subscribe to is allowing our patients to be informed and making their own decisions because that's that's one of the key principles of of medicine is you know we don't we don't force people to do things we don't we don't say well you have to take this medication you have to follow up with me we, we encourage it and we try to support our patients in any way that we can but ultimately the the decision is left up to the patient it's their body and. Although it may hurt family members and it may be discouraging to have to go through things like that, it, it really is up to the patient to make that decision to say, you know what, I don't want to do chemotherapy. I don't want to do radiation therapy. So, Val, you're almost in the role of a law enforcer in that situation when you have to deal with a relative who's saying, well, we need to push back against that because you have to sit that person down and say, hold on, wait a minute. Yeah, you know, it, it can be really frustrating in my experience, personal and professional, you know, it's usually there's been relatives who are from out of town who are not really there day to day, and they're the ones saying, we really need to get aggressive with this. Let's get them in the best treatment opportunity. And the people that are in the trenches are like, you know, he's not really wanting this. He, he doesn't want to spend his last three months in and out uh, treatments. He just wants to enjoy his family. And there's often that, that tug of war, you know, and it, like Jeremy said, it can be a really tough decision, but communication is a key, and getting everybody on the same page, feeling like they can support each other, 
it's so helpful for, for everybody involved, not just the patient, but the, but the family members. I can recall uh, one of my grandmothers when she was, uh, she was in her early 80s, and we knew it was near the end, and we'd have family come into the room, and they would tell her, you know, well, you got to go on, and, you know, and, 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 and they would argue with her about it. And one day after a group of them left, I was sitting in the room alone with her. She turned and she looked at me, and she smiled, and she said, I'm 83 years old. I have five wonderful kids. I raised them. They never got in any serious trouble. She said, I've done my job. I don't have any worries about this. And and so she, her, her attitude was, I'm ready to go. And yet she was butting heads with a lot of other people in the family over all of that. Yeah, it, it can be really tough. And, you know, the roles change. As soon as a di- cancer diagnosis comes along, you know, is the provider still the provider? Is the caregiver still the caregiver? Who's taking care of the kids, you know, depending on the age? I think Dr. Tripp was saying that, you know, they've got recently, you know, 20-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 60-year-olds. Mm-hmm. It covers the gamut. So the roles really have to adjust. And with that can come anger. And the caregivers really need to remember, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of self-care for the caregiver, not just care for the patient. You know, you still need your coping skills. You still need to figure out how to take care of yourself so you can be helpful to, the, to your loved one. We have a telephone caller joining us. We're coming up on 849. It's 37. And, of course, you're listening to Better Health with Trip Family Medicine this morning. And, caller, you're on the air. Good morning. I just wanted to chime in and give other people uh, some word of advice and hopefully don't make the same mistake I did. My wife just recently was treated for melanoma, stage 3B. Mm-hmm. Uh and and she came out of it, and she's doing very good now. But at the time, I watched her waist. I mean, they literally take you to death. And it was killing me. And I couldn't watch it. And I've had, I had other people helping her and everything else. I couldn't watch it. And in the end, she all she wanted was me. And I wasn't there. And I'm paying for it now. So if anybody else is out there doing the same thing, stand by and and be tough, but don't be afraid to say how you're feeling. I don't know if the two of you have any follow-up to that. Well, you know, he, I, I can hear his struggle, but there's help out there. Not, you know, the, the doctors know how to treat the patient the best they can, but all this emotional turmoil and the fear that he was facing and his love for his wife, there's help for that. You know, talk to somebody. If it's not family or friends that you really trust, find find a professional that can help you process that grief and that fear and that all those angst and, and find a way to work through it so you can be there. Good news is that she's on the mend at this point. So there's yeah, a, the, the silver lining or the, Definitely. the happy, <laughs> happy potential ending there. Uh, for for people who are coming in, and 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 I assume that uh, that stress level, as we pointed out, is so high for the caregivers. Uh, there are some programs I know around the country where people are actually they have substitutes come in for a couple of days to give the caregiver a break so the caregiver can get some rest. Because let's say you're already seventy, seventy five years old, and you're caring for a family member who's seventy. Uh, you're going to be pretty well run down after about three or four months of this, I would assume. Uh, maybe not quite as much as the patient, but it's going to take a toll on your own health. Definitely. You know, something that we see a lot is it's called caregiver distress syndrome, where you have, you know, people who, in a lot of ways, they, they take diagnoses worse than the patient. And, you know, they it becomes their um, obsession, so to speak. They, they, they can't resume their normal life in any way because they have this fear that if they do anything else that, you know, they're going to lose opportunities and miss out on time with that loved one. And uh, so they, they devote everything that they have, their energy, their time, their attention to that loved one. And, and it can be, you know, emotionally exhausting, physically exhausting. And, you know, a lot of times that's when we see a lot of people become sick. Um, Immune systems are run down and, you know, they just, they stop taking care of themselves and in um, this pursuit of, basically doing whatever they can to, to help the loved one out. And, you know, it, it's, it is one of those things that it's understandable in some ways, but, you know, like Val was saying, there, there's so many good resources and tools out there and, 
you know, people come to us often for, for counseling and, you know, we do our best to provide information and, and support, but really the people that, that we encourage our patients to see are people like Val who, who are trained to give the information that the patients need to provide them with tools in order for them to cope with the situation and, and, you know, work through these problems in a way that's, that's healthy and that, you know, will make the end of life situation a little bit more bearable. Can I throw out a scenario? And this is a hypothetical, but I'm sure it happens in this area. We have a lot of retirees who come to, uh, to Southern Idaho from other parts of the country. So many times they're living 2,000, 2,500 miles away from the, the support network. And then if you've got uh, just a couple, an older couple and um, a spouse suddenly is, is sick with cancer, uh, that support network might be in California or, or in Texas or in Mississippi. How do you then, I mean, they don't have anywhere to fall back, right? Mm, that could be really, really tough. Uh, you know, th- there are a lot of resources online, family members, if you're out of town, cancer.org, cancer.gov. It gives it a lot of help for a long distance support. Um, but really, the patient has got to be able to find some support day to day, you know, somebody to sit with them during the treatment, somebody to give them a quick card or a quick follow up after treatment. How did it go? Thinking about you. Those, those little gifts, a, a little mementos, it really does a lot for the patients. And, and it, it really sets everybody up for a little bit of success. Of, I can be here for you and, and I know how to help. So it's, it's important if, you're, if your loved one is out of town, there's ways to help. Um, but it's really important to have support right here close by. And, and, and again, if they just talk to you, you can help them, you can direct them wherever they can, they, they really need to go. Yeah, there, there really is, <clears throat> excuse me, there really is a lot of support here in Twin Falls. You know, they do a, a good job of, of reaching out, whether it's support groups, whether it's uh, professional help, or whether it's hooking up peer-to-peer. You know, sometimes somebody going through prostate cancer treatment, talking to another patient who's been through that mm-hmm. can really, really be helpful. And family members really can't understand. So uh, doctors do a good job, you know, linking up that support. I've already had that because I used to hang around with a coffee group in the morning at the local diner at my last job. And you know what? Uh, I think out of the, the, the half a dozen guys, four of them had been through that already. Yeah. So <laughs> that was quite a, there was an instant support network. We've got about three minutes to go. Before we wrap up, Val contact information that people need to reach your office. How do they go about doing that? Uh, they can call my office at uh, Erico 208. 420-8621. And uh, Jeremy over at uh, Trip Family Medicine, That's uh, right. contact is? 933-4400, and we're located on Fillmore, 1411 Fillmore, Suite 600, 600, right in front of the post office. Yes, yeah, so when you come out of the very, very busy post office and look across the street, you'll see the There office. we are. Yes. There we are. It's always busy at that post office. Uh, and again, a Facebook presence, too. Yeah, we're we're trying to get on Facebook a little bit more and and you know make sure that we put these specific uh, radio shows on Facebook and things that we're doing and programs that we're doing. Um, pretty quickly, we're going to be doing some sports physicals for the for the schools here in town for the spring sports. And so you know we we try to get out into the community and and do our best to to help families and athletes and things like that. I don't want to put you on the spot because it's not the same topic. But yesterday I was reading. Uh story about the assisted suicide law in Oregon. Hmm. I assume that people who uh, who are going through that, the, the situation for family members is probably identical because you've got family members who are saying, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, and, and we're seeing such a tumult in the medical community at the moment, really nationwide, that that you, you've got to really be on your toes to stay ahead of all of this. Oh, definitely. You know, and I think that that's one of those big medical ethical questions is, well, what do you do? And, um, I, another, one of the principles that we, the, the founding principles of medical ethics is it's called primum non nocere. And it means first do no harm. And, you know, I, I feel like that's a violation of, of that principle. You know, maybe, maybe the person feels like it's more harm for them to be alive, but definitely as a professional, we do our best to keep people alive and well. So I don't know. That it, is, that is a definite, I, I knew an old clergyman. I did an interview with him for a documentary about 15 years ago mm-hmm. and on his 87th birthday. And a year later, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he ended up refusing all treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it may have been painful, I thought, for him in his final 
final days, but that was his choice again. Uh, but uh, but he just he he insisted on that, uh, and he was able and conscious right up until almost the end before he passed away. Uh, some people obviously have the tolerance for that, I would imagine, but not all of us do. No, no, and that's that's why you know it's really an individual decision, and you know people at the end of life they. They should be able to make those decisions. Ultimately, they're the ones who are in charge of, of their situation and their body. So, you know, we want we want patients and their families to work together at that difficult time to get through it. And it's it's really a team effort. And if you need someone to talk to, find someone to talk to, please. Val C. Lee and, uh, and Jeremy Daly, I want to thank you both for coming by today. Uh, Nine o'clock news is just ahead in a moment. Also, uh, Sean Berrigar, uh, now mayor of Twin Falls, scheduled to join us just after nine o'clock news. If you have a comment or question for him, feel free to give us a shout at 736-0300, at 736-0300. You're listening to Top Story with Bill Colley as well on News Radio 1310, KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com.